Assalamu alaikum. My question is for Mr. Yusuf. I have a Christian friend and we always have discussions on uh, Islam and Christianity. And whenever we have a discussion on the Bible, she always tells me that if you say the Bible has been changed by people and is not the exact true word, then how come I get so much of peace when I read the Bible? She says that when she reads it, she feels closer to God. How do I counter this question? I don't know if I'm in the right place to tell you this or not. We got a lot of fans here that like the idea of having debates with people. We got a lot of Ahmadidat fans, and we love him very much. And Dr. Zecher Knight's fans are here. I'm in the heart of that. So uh, what I say may not go over real well, but I have to tell you something. I'm not a big fan of debating with the people over the Bible. Now, you can debate with them about a lot of things. What do you believe about God? That's, uh, I'm right here. Come on, let's debate all day long. But when you start to criticize the Bible, you got a problem. You got a real big problem because the very beginning of this book right here, when it tells you, there's no doubt in this book, it's a source of hidayah for those that have taqwa for Allah. And then it continues to tell you, but it's only going to be for those that have the taqwa for Allah. Then they have to believe in the ghaib, the unseen. They have to establish regular worship. They have to pay their zakah. Then they have to believe that this is coming down to Muhammad and Sallallahu And they have to believe in the book that came before. Then at the end of the same surah, it's telling you that these people, they say, those that are on the right belief, we believe in Allah, and that katubihi means his books or book. And you have, to, you have to understand that the Bible really was from Allah. So if I criticize even what maybe one or two words are still there from Allah, I would be criticizing Allah's word. It's not a good idea. I don't see that as being a good challenge to attack it because a lot of what I understand today, I got from the Bible. And I found clarification and confirmation in the Quran. In fact, I continued my studies of the Bible in the Greek and in the Hebrew for two and a half more years after I was a Muslim. I didn't stop until I completed my degree in it because I, I just had something inside of me knowing that I, there's something here. And it finally came to me and then I was able to put the Bible down and relax. I found out there really is no contradiction in the Bible except where it contradicts itself. Duh. And when I realized that, I said, then the only way I'm going to understand the Bible is to go to the book without the contradiction. And it says in here about the unbelievers, haven't they considered if it was from other than a law, they'll find within it many contradictions. Go ahead, find one. Go ahead. There's a clear contradiction here. I want you to listen real close to this contradiction. God is not a man. God is not the son of man. You hear that? Now that sounds like I'm reading out of Surah Ikhlas, doesn't it? Huh? Lam yalid wa lam yulad. It sounds like that, doesn't it? God is not a man, and God is not the son of man. That's in the Bible. That's in Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. I know you want to write that down for your Christian friend. <laughs> Go and show him it's in the Old Testament. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. Then take them up to the New Testament. In Luke chapter, what, 3, chapter 3, last verse, 38. Look at it. The last verse said, Enos is the son of Seth. And Seth, which was a brother to Cain and Abel, Seth is the son of Adam, and Adam is the son of God. Who? Adam is the son of God. Now, their argument will be, yeah, but that has a little s. And when we talk about Jesus, we use a big s. I got news for you. In the Semitic languages, which includes Arabic, Aramaic, Hebrew, there are no capital letters. There's no upper lowercase letters. So that's a moot point. It doesn't work. But what I suggest you to do is don't 
don't try to upset her. Uh, let me explain why the overall picture of this. If I'm going to debate with them and I finally convince them the Bible is not from God, if I did, which, well, I already give you the argument the other side, but if I said, okay, now what do you think? She said, I'll never pick it up again. I will never go to the Bible to find any peace again. I'm never going to do it. I'm totally away from it. Do you think that makes her a Muslim? That's not called a Shahada, is it? Is it? It sounded to me like she left something, but you didn't give her anything. So what I do is try to encourage them to read in the Quran. What do you think it is that she likes to read? I'll tell you what it probably is. She's probably reading Psalms. She could be reading out of Jeremiah. She could be reading Ecclesiastes. All of these have very good parables and teachings in there. Some are so much like the Sunnah of Muhammad, salam, you'd be surprised. The one in there about how do you uh, worry about the speck in somebody else's eye when you have a, a log in your own eye is from the Sunnah as well as from the Bible. The one about the camel going through the door thing. Again, the same thing. So a lot of the things, if you're going to criticize the Bible, you're criticizing the Quran and the Sunnah both. So I really encourage you to find what's good about what she says and encourage her to consider what Islam says the same thing. The Bible says God is one. It says it real clear. So why do I want to argue with her about that? That wouldn't make sense. Uh, the example, chapter 12, verse 29 in Mark, they asked Jesus about, oh, good master, what is the, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, according to what survives of the Bible today, he tells them, no, O Israel. Because remember, according to him, he only came to the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. No, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord. And you have to worship him with all your heart and all your love and, and all your uh, might. So if this is a teaching that they have, what do I have that's different than that? Do I want to attack them on exactly... Uh, I convince them, put all that out of your mind, and then come over to me, and I'm going to reteach you the same thing again. That doesn't make any sense. And you're like cutting somebody off and sinking their ship and not giving them anywhere to go. As Sheikh Jaffer was telling us before when we talked about building bridges, he said, you don't have to build any bridges. The bridges are there. Just have to help the people clear the way to see that get on the bridge and come on over to Islam. Because you got to remember that the best of the Christians are coming into Islam because they're doing what their book told them to do, which we mentioned earlier, and that is to submit to God on his terms and ask, oh God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If they're sincere about that, what's the logical conclusion? The Bible tells them, I didn't mean to turn this into a speech. You want me to stop here? Yeah, I'll wrap that up there. I'll, then another time we'll go on, I'll tell you the rest of that one. The idea is, though, don't, don't make a big deal out of it. Don't attack their book and attack them. They're the closest to us, really, and I'd like to see them know more about us. Take it easy. It might take them a long time. My dad was a hard sell. So he was not easy. He was a hard sell case, but he made a shahada. So just be patient with her. Pray for her, and it's Allah that's going to guide her, not you anyway. Okay, I would just add one point, just a point of reason, that she is judging the Bible as being guidance or a source of guidance or true based on the fact that she gets peace from it. You see, so we just, I would only try to explain to her that uh, when we're going to try to determine the rightness or wrongness of a thing, we don't do it according to how we feel about it emotionally. Because if a Hindu reads the Bhagavad Gita and he gets peace and serenity from it, or somebody else reads Mein Kampf and gets peace and serenity out of it, you know, we, we don't equate these. You know, we have to look objectively is this the truth or is it not the truth? So we need to look at things not from an emotional perspective and how I feel, but what is the objective reality here? What is the book which really hasn't been changed? It claims it's not been changed. And we have proof for that. Whereas the other book, it is not Muslims who are saying the book has been changed. It is Christian scholars who have said the book has been changed. You know? So we use some practical criterion for determining as opposed to getting caught up in the emotions. So we try to get them to a logical perspective, then we can also help them along. And as our brother pointed out, that uh, the fact that 
we don't or we believe that the Quran the, the, the Bible has been changed because the Quran tells us that changes have taken place but it doesn't mean that everything in it is not correct that's the point we respect it uh, respect what is in it of the truth that has come and that's why Allah declared them to be closest to us why we're able to marry their women why we're able to eat their slaughter etc etc because of what they still carry in their scriptures of truth